This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Denise Allen, who is curator in the Department of European Sculpture and Decorative Arts at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And previously, she was a curator at the Frick Collection and the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. So with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Denise. Thank you very much. Um... Well, I'm Denise Allen, and uh, so I work in European sculpture uh, from about 1450 to 1700. And um, in the spring of 2019, when we were all in lockdown, uh, council's office got in touch with our department saying that we were being given uh, a collection of 300, about 300 medals and plaquettes. This came completely out of the blue. Um, and it was the uh, bequest of Mark and Lottie Salton. I can't tell you what an extraordinary uh, uh, bequest this is and what it means uh, to the collection. Or maybe I can tell you because in fact, that's what I'm talking about today. <laughs> Um, but the Salton collection, it's about 300 medals. I won't discuss plaquettes today. Um, and that span the range from the beginning of the Medalla Guard in Italy in the mid 15th century, all the way through to the late 19th century. It's a, comp it's a, you know, a, a European wide collection. So we have Italy, France, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, and some other countries represented uh, and uh, it fills in some extraordinary gaps in the Mets collection, one of them being uh, the, the alarming uh, sort of a scarcity of Netherlandish, uh, silver Netherlandish uh, metals, uh, and also um, German metals of the Renaissance. Uh, but before I really begin this talk, uh, I want you uh, just to see the Saltons here in this photograph. And I'm drawing this from uh, uh, partly from David Hill's uh, wonderful uh, essay for the ANS. Uh, but you see Lottie and Mark Salton here. Um, and I want to express my most profound gratitude toward them. I am sorry that I never had the privilege of meeting them, uh, but I hope that there are members of this audience uh, that uh, will hear uh, this expression of thanks uh, on behalf of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, I also want to thank the ANS because of COVID uh, the medals were housed at the ANS, or the ANS took care of them until uh, 20, September 2021 when they came to the Met. Uh, and for that, I have absolute thanks. My thanks also go to Ira Rizak and Ellen Stahl, the trustees of the uh, Salton uh, estate. Uh, and I also want to thank. Um, Luke Sison, uh, former uh, chair of my department, European Sculpture and Decorative Arts, uh, for having worked uh, with members of your institution, the ANS, uh, to sort of encourage this gift. Uh, Luke famously was a curator of Renaissance medals at the British Museum before he went on to other things. Um, so. Uh, with that, uh, you have my, my thanks. Um, I'm showing the Saltons along with the Salton uh, exhibition catalog of 1965, because their medals were shown at Bowdoin College uh, that, at that time. And that still is the basis of uh, our survey of the Salton collection uh, at this moment. Uh, the introduction uh, was written uh, by uh, Lottie Salton, and it's engaging and informative and brings along with it uh, not only you know, expertise, but also uh, an, uh, kind of um, an excitement about the medallic arts. 
Uh, I also want to uh, just uh, highlight, uh, if you want to know more about the Saltons, and many of you probably have this anyway, but it's available online. This was sent to me by Ira Ritzak uh, of the Kunker sale of uh, the Salton medals uh, on behalf of BANS. Um, and they did a beautiful 115-page uh, book uh, about the uh, Salton family, about uh, their terrible experience in the during the Holocaust, um, and uh, and uh, Lottie and uh, Mark Salton's journey to the United States, where they rebuilt their lives and collected uh, coins and also medals. And uh, you, on the cover is a. Uh, Felix uh, Schlesinger, who was uh, Mark's father, uh, who was a numismatist and uh, the, one of the greatest coin dealers uh, in Europe, uh, who tragically was murdered uh, in 1944 in Auschwitz. In January of 2022, the ANS also received the Salton Archive. Um, and I have, I, we were just talking before this started, I have to pay a visit soon because Mark Salton, uh, being an expert uh, in numismatics and uh, also extraordinarily knowledgeable in metals, uh, kept you know, detailed records of uh, the metals in his collection. And you see at the top, uh, some of the, um, uh, you see a Matteo de Pasti medal of Sigismondo Malatesta from uh, the sort of mid 15th century. Uh, so I need to come and look at look at look at the papers uh, as we start cataloging um, the works uh, in uh, that have come to us from the Saltons. So the ANS is ahead of us uh, with all of this material. Um, here uh, I show you during uh, my visit in 2020 to survey the Salton Metals collection. Uh, this is how. Uh, I found it and um, it, it came directly from the Salton's, you know, the storage where they had stored these metals. And uh, they all were wrapped in etiquettes. Uh, you see an etiquette uh, below in uh, Mark Salton's handwriting. Uh, they were kept in things like cigar boxes. And, um, and it was a, a kind of a terrifying moment. I relied on the Bowdoin catalog, as you see, uh, and then the lists that uh, Ira Ritzak had reviewed and annotated. That's on the left with the red uh, pencil. Now, what is wonderful about this experience uh, at the ANS in 2020 was discovery. So if you look at the wonderful um, Corona cigar box, you'll see on top, uh, currency of fame. Uh, and that uh, was a surprise because this medal that I'm about to show you was not uh, in the Bowdoin catalog, but here it is. Uh, it's by uh, Johann Philipp van der Poot. Uh, and it was shown in the landmark exhibition uh, curated by Stephen Schur, uh, the currency of fame. It's a silver medal um, it's extraordinary. And as I said, the Met does not have very many uh, German Renaissance medals at all. Um, and so this, uh, I think, rather terrifying looking man is, is, will be part of our collection. Uh, it's an extraordinary medal uh, with detail, uh, uh, salience. Um, it seems almost as if uh, the sitter is about to just kind of launch out of, uh, out of, off of the background um, and uh, take part in, with you in your space. So this was just great excitement like this during this period of time, uh, just being at the ANS. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about the, uh, the Mets collection. So you get an, some idea of uh, what, what the Salton collection means uh, to the Meadows collection, and then later on to other collections at the Met. Uh, what, you, uh, what I'm showing you here are medals all at the Met, and uh, the Met collection uh, could be characterized as spotty and mixed. Uh, this is the result of um, 
the collection being mainly composed of gifts and bequests. A lot of them came in the 1930s. Um, and uh, then very, very few uh, individual acquisitions. I show you one of the high points, the amazing medal at the upper right by Bertoldo, uh, the Florentine artist, also a founder of, of the medallic arts, uh, early medalist, uh, who worked for the me uh, and Michelangelo's teacher. And it's a Filippo de' Medici arch, as Archbishop of Pisa. And the reverse is uh, shows the last judgment, which, um, influenced Michelangelo's uh, composition of the Lost Judgment uh, in uh, the Sistine Chapel, famously. And uh, Bertoldo was one of Michelangelo's teachers. Uh, below you see one of the great sort of uh, gifts to the Met uh, in 1975 of the Robert Lehman collections. And uh, medals were, are a part of that. And uh, you see high points, like amazing French medals, like the Dupre at the far left, and then uh, Lysippus the Younger and uh, Francesco Fra Francia at the right. But um, then you see many, which are like the uh, Bertoldo portrait medal of Sultan Mehmed II, uh, which uh, you know is an old aftercast. Uh, there's also part of the Lehman collection uh, our 19th century casts after famous medals that the Met, you know, never acquired. Um, so there's that as well. What you don't see here are very many German, Netherlandish medals. Uh, there's some, but not very many at all. And so that is not represented. So there are great gaps in the collection and the Salton medal will really help to fill that. Um, so I'm showing you now, uh, some of the, dis, uh, the highlights of the collection as a group, just a fantastic, fantastic things. Um, you know, uh, and this is a mix of, there's a Danish medal here, the, the bronze at the upper right is Sperandio, um, and uh, we'll see uh, the others uh, as we go on. Perversely, I am uh, not going to begin with medals, but with two things that really, really excited me when I when I saw them because they they are relatively rare or at least in this kind of condition. And one is a, a papal bulla, and that is the lead seal at the upper left. Uh, that is affixed to uh, papal briefs. Uh, so when the Pope makes a decree, it gets distributed and it is tied up uh, with, with string or with other material, fancier material, if it's a more important decree. And that seal, that lead seal is affixed to it and seals the document. Uh, what you see on the right is a, a, a document from the time of Leo X. And you see that the papal bulle, bulle, bulle are, um, are actually sort of of a type, right? Uh, and so you have the heads of the, uh, the faces of St. Peter and St. Paul, which you know are the the sort of the twin guardians of uh, of uh, the Vatican, um, Peter being the first pope and Paul uh, being so important for the the Gospels. Um, in any case, uh, also as part of this uh, group uh, or in the Salton collection is the bronze medal you see above of Sixtus the Fourth uh, wearing. Uh, the tiara, uh, and you see the reverse of the papal bull, which is, you know, it has his name at the back inscribed. And below is a silver uh, medal, uh, the same medal in silver in the Lehman collection. What I find so astonishing about the, uh, this juxtaposition is that uh, Sixtus was all about aggrandizing papal power, both earthly, uh, earthly power. Uh, so the triple crown or tiara is meant to be worn by the Pope only when he is mani manifesting his power over earth. But Sixtus also shows himself being crowned with the tiara by uh, Saint uh, Francis and Saint Anthony. Um, Sixtus was a Franciscan, uh, but, uh, and so those are Franciscan saints. But the point here is that he is connecting in the obverse and reverse of this medal uh, his status as a, a reigning pope on earth with uh, the divine power that it, uh, he is assumed from heaven as the vicar of Christ on earth. 
um, in this metal. Um, and that is astonishing uh, in its boldness, even for a Pope who was as bold as Sixtus, but he would be surpassed uh, by his papal nephew uh, in this way, uh, Julius II. So this bulla kind of brings to life all of these relationships. And, um, and the Lysippus, the young bird metal here is, you know, it helps to write the history of Sixtus's papacy. Also something that uh, just took me away is this gold uh, bulla now from Venice and it's um, uh, Doge Andrea Griti. And uh, he was Doge uh, in between 1523 and 39. Um, and you see on the left, St. Mark, the patron saint of Venice, uh, bestowing the, uh, the staff of office of power of rule uh, to Doge Griti. Uh, and you see Dux is right beside Griti's uh, profile. Now the source for this medal uh, is, uh, or, or, or of the bulla, is uh, the Venetian gold ducat. Uh, and you see uh, one from Griti's uh, reign as Doge on the right. Uh, it was sort of this, one of the standards of, of you know, currency uh, during, uh, during, uh, in Europe at that time, the Venetian ducat. Uh, but what is astonishing about this, and again, we're in a moment where rulers are, again, aggrandizing and publicizing their power, is that Greti on the, on the bulla um, is standing. He's not kneeling before St. Mark. He is standing. Uh, he's almost co-equal uh, with the patron saint of Venice. Uh, Greti was uh, quite a powerful character. Uh, and, um, and it is just sort of memor memorably inscribed in relief uh, on this bulla. And as to the medals collection, uh, the bulla I would like to show with uh, a gift of uh, the Peluso family of 2010, uh, this wonderful um, portrait by the medalist Andrea Spinelli of 1534, uh, which sh shows uh, Doge Andrea Griti, uh, but also on the reverse, uh, the, uh, he, his uh, successful renovation of uh, San Francesco in Vigna, in uh, Della Vigna in Venice, uh, uh, the church in which he was buried. And um, so I think this would be a wonderful juxtaposition. And because the Pelusos uh, gave two medals, we could show uh, this sequence, uh, the medal, medallic portrait, uh, uh, front or, or obverse and reverse. Now, a little bit about artists, which I, I really love. Some of the artists uh, that the Met, uh, you know, shows uh, come to life when we have their portraits. Uh, one of them is by, you know, one of the most admired medalists of all time, uh, Pisanello. Uh, and uh, this is his uh, portrait, a uh, medallic portrait by uh, an unknown artist, I think. Uh, and on the left, you see that uh, this medal was featured on the catalog. Now, this is the best, uh, probably, uh, or of the highest quality of the Pisanello medals, you know, or associated medals that the Met owns, well, or one of them. What the Met owns uh, uh, and what the Sultan uh, collection uh, exhibits are medals that uh, Stephen Schur has told me are representative. Uh, so on the left, you see uh, the Leonello uh, Deste medal, the famous medal uh, showing uh, on the reverse you know, uh, love uh, uh, teaching Leonello the lion in Italian how to sing. And on the right is the medal in the Lehman collection, an old aftercast as it's cataloged of Cecilia Gonzaga with an equally poetic reverse. Now, these are representative. They're not of the highest quality casts, but what they allow them to do is to really consider uh, what a reverse like this means. And uh, I'll show you just one example. And that is uh, the Met acquisition 
uh, this year, this spring of the uh, large uh, 14 uh, inches in diameter uh, bronze and gilt and silvered rondel showing Venus, Mars, Cupid and Vulcan at his forge of about 15, 1500. Um, this, is highly dependent on uh, the tradition of metals, right? Established by Pisanello. And it is so like to the Pisanello, not in style, but in uh, ambition. So pictorial ambition, both. Uh, and Pisanello was there so many years before, right? Uh, 60 years before. Um, but in inventing the metal, inventing this, uh, showing on the reverse a landscape setting as does a Cavalli in the roundel, um, contrasting uh, sound, right? The lion is learning how to sing in the uh, roundel. The sound of Vulcan's hammer blows on the anvil create music or tones that inspired Pythagoras to discover the mathematical harmo harmonic proportions. Um, but that's contrasted with silence. Venus and Mars fall in love without a sound um, by just looking into each other's eyes. So both of, the, both of these works, uh, their subject matter is infused with poetry. Uh, it has a poetic impulse, a humanist impulse. Um, and Having the Sultan uh, medal uh, by Pisanello uh, in the Met now allows us to explore uh, these veins in, in Renaissance relief uh, even more deeply than we would have done before. Another artist that uh, I, I loved, I, I just love to have this at, at the Met is the uh, portrait of um, the painter uh, Giovanni Bellini by Gambello. Uh, and um, you see here, and it's about, I think around 1510 or so, uh, uh, Gambello was a medalist, but he also was a sculptor. And Bellini was a painter, uh, the, probably one of the most famous painters in Venice, right, uh, that Venice has ever produced. And that was true in his own lifetime. Uh, and so he earned that medal, uh, tri medallic tribute by Gambello. But what is um, beautiful is how uh, Gambello plays with uh, the inscription. So the inscription uh, is uh, uh, on the back above an owl is virtutis ingenii or virtue and by virtue or a virtue and, and genius, right? Artistic genius or fantasy um, and uh, below uh, Gambello signs his own name, Victor Camellius, um, and he has many different names here, and so I can't read the, the name exactly, but, uh, and then he writes below that, Facebat, which is, I was making this. So he's signing himself uh, as a sculptor would, uh, uh, as sculptors did in, um, in Pliny. Uh, so by doing this, uh, Gambello poses the question, is this metal, you know, with its owl of wisdom, with its virtue and, and fantasy and genius on the reverse, is this a metal uh, that celebrates Gambello? Or is this uh, a metal that on the obverse with Bellini's portraits celebrates uh, Bellini? Well, it celebrates both. Uh, and that is uh, the, the kind of wonderful intersection among the arts um, in, during the Renaissance, uh, especially during the Renaissance. And what I show you below is the Met's current version, version of the medal, which was given, uh, I think in the 1920s, yeah, 1924. And so we will compare that with the Salton medal uh, and uh, see if we can't show them side by side. But this comparison of the arts is kind of beautiful. I'm showing you two works from the Met's collection. Uh, one of uh, Gambello's great small bronzes, the Hercules uh, shooting at the St Stymphalian birds. Um, on the left, uh, the metal with this, you know, 
this posing this question, right? Genius and virtue. Uh, is it the sculptor? Is it the painter? No, it is both. And on the right is a, a really well-preserved painting by Bellini's workshop uh, of around the same date. So all of these three things uh, date to around 1510 or so, uh, and, um, and the, uh, of the Madonna and child. So um, this, just having these portrait medals available to us makes, a, I think, a huge difference in our understanding of the works of art in the Mets collection. Now, I want you to brace yourselves a bit because we've been dealing with uh, sort of the, the restrained and, uh, and profound uh, character of the Renaissance in Italy in the, in the, the largely circa 1500 and a little before, but now we're going to Germany and the tenor changes. And these are two extraordinary uh, medals. The one you've seen already, it's uh, by Van der Put, the silver medal that was in currency of fame. But uh, next to it, I'm showing you uh, uh, the, uh, by an anonymous artist, uh, but it's a portrait of Hieronymus Algauer, uh, and it is in uh, Kelheim st uh, stone, and um, which is probably like Hohenstein, um, but one of these uh, hard stones that, you know, that the, uh, the German sculptors love to, to, to use for uh, models and then as uh, metals. Um, and it, so these are two very different materials, silver versus stone, but with the same kind of sharpness and vigor of execution uh, that, uh, that are so memorable. And of course, uh, you know, the vendor put probably did use, so you could have used a, uh, a wood or probably a stone model uh, he might have done to create his metal. Um, we also, uh, also part of the salt and bequest is this wax portrait, uh, which was in the currency of fame as well. Um, it's a anonymous master, uh, Nuremberg, uh, patrician, again, of, of mid-century. And um, you get, again, this startling lifelike quality. I think that is so characteristic of German metals. Uh, perhaps it has to do with the always showing uh, the sitters or sh often showing the sitters in three-quarter view, uh, which makes them a bit more expressive than the profile view, of course. Uh, but it's also the sensibility, uh, this hyper-naturalism uh, is uh, just, part of, of portraiture at the time. And now uh, this object is being uh, planned uh, to take pride of place in uh, the installation of the new Ren uh, Northern Renaissance galleries that will open at the Met in uh, next year, by the summer of next year. And here you see, you can get a sense of the scale of the, of the wax, it's on the left. Uh, I'm sorry that the tag, they put the tag over the front, but you know, can't have everything. Uh, and uh, what they're doing is a tryout for the case that will introduce uh, uh, the kind of Habsburg, the Imperial Habsburg, uh, uh, place the Northern art in an Imperial Habsburg context. So you have uh, portraits in various media and that great painted goblet uh, shows every state in, in the Habsburg empire, uh, the crest of every state. Uh, so, uh, that work uh, you can come to the Met to see next year. Now I'm moving on to uh, Italian medals and uh, uh, sort of mid 16th century Italian medals. And I uh, spend a, a good deal of my uh, scholarly life uh, working on Benvenuto Cellini. So this is just a personal, personal choice because uh, uh, the medal that you see on the left from the Salton collection is of Cosimo de' Medici, the first Duke of Florence. It dates to the end of it, toward the end of his reign, 1567. And it's uh, by one of Cellini's contemporaries, the uh, goldsmith sculptor, uh, Domenico Poggini. And in Cellini's uh, autobiography, he even talks about uh, the Poggini uh, working in, you know, the, uh, the, the ducal offices, right? The, um, uh, the Uffizi, right? That's where they had their goldsmith shop. And Cellini, of course, not being the, uh, 
let's say the most uh, charitable soul, you know, he compared his genius uh, against their lack thereof, uh, but he respected them. In any case, uh, Domenico Poggini was a, a fantastic medalist, as you see in the struck silver medal here. Um, so Cosimo is shown as Duke, uh, and on the reverse is uh, a fountain, uh, showing the fountain of Neptune. Um, I show you here on the right, uh, Domenico Poggini's uh, uh, carving abilities. This is Bacchus. Um, and uh, he signed it uh, at Bacchus's foot, he signed it uh, Domenico uh, Poggini uh, Orifex. So he signed himself as a goldsmith when he carved this to show his, you know, the multivalence of his uh, talents. Um, people do not appreciate this sculpture enough uh, uh, and more work needs to be done. It's a, actually a wonderful object. Now at the Met, uh, we can uh, see the Salton medal was in silver from 1567. We can compare it to uh, this wonderful portrait of Cosimo uh, from the Grand Ducal Workshops that's on view now. Uh, it's carved in lapis lazuli. Uh, and it has to have been based on the, the metal. Um, on the right, you see um, a slightly earlier metal uh, that uh, Domenico made uh, of Cosimo. And uh, you can see how uh, he, uh, how, how his, his talent, uh, you know, he's looking at two very different things. The metal on the right uh, is a much more naturalistic portrait. Uh, the metal on the left, uh, much more harsh. I mean, it's sort of an emblem of ducal power. He doesn't, uh, uh, Cosimo does not appear very human. Um, in, or natural in the uh, in the uh, metal on the right uh, left sorry the Salton metal and that actually uh, is the point. Now the reverses of, of each of these metals uh, are amazing. So I'm showing you the Aminati uh, fountain in front of the Palazzo Vecchio, uh, and the reverse has. Uh, 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 one of the best uh, best uh, reverse inscriptions uh, in, in ancient Roman way. And it says, quo melior op, op, optabilior. Uh, and um, it just means uh, we're making a good thing better. Uh, the, uh, because what uh, this metal celebrates is the, uh, the aqueduct that bring, brought water to um, Florence that was built by Cosimo. And, uh, the fountain uh, was completed two years later. So uh, making a good thing better uh, um, on the back. So there's the, the art that celebrates the, you know, the triumph of the aqueduct um, and Neptune and uh, the control of the waves. And on the right is, uh, it shows it's uh, the, uh, for the public convenience is the inscription and you see the Uffizi galleries, right? That famous long view to the uh, Palazzo Vecchio. And standing uh, between uh, the two buildings of the Uffizi uh, is a figure that uh, is carrying a, um, a cornucopia and holding scales. And she is Florence, uh, one of the famous statues in Florence uh, that showed uh, public prosperity it was the Dovizia by Donatello that bears uh, a, a you know, abundance in her arm. Uh, so you get the idea of good government uh, and, and prosperity. That is for the public convenience and good. But the medals capture, uh, that's why I put the photos underneath them, they capture the whole sense of being in Florence somehow, um, especially uh, the, the medal on the right. But uh, it's a wonderful rendering of Aminati's fountain as well. Uh, you know, before it was completed. Um, one of the great medals, uh, I think that is from the Salton collection is the silver medal by Giampaolo Poggini, um, who uh, went to uh, Madrid uh, and to work for Philip II. It dates to 1559. You see uh, Philip on the, on the right and this marvelous reverse, uh, which, uh, which says in the inscription, um, 
you know, the piece of uh, uh, earth or the land and sea are united in peace. Uh, and in Philip's uh, portrait on the obverse of the medal, famously, uh, he is identified as king of the old world and of the new world. Uh, but here is peace. Uh, there have been articles written about this reverse because of its beauty uh, and its sophisticated combinations of um, elements from the work of Benvenuto Cellini and also ancient metals. So peace with her corn cornucopia takes a torch to you know, the surrendered arms at her feet and behind her uh, in beautiful three quarter view um, is the uh, temple of Janus with the doors closed because all are at peace. Now I'd like you to also just take on, uh, take a look at the, the wonderful, wonderful uh, patina on uh, the silver medals. Uh, this one has been cleaned at some point, but many of the medals in the Salton collection uh, have a beautiful even, uh, let's say uh, gray tarnish, but let's call it a silver patina. And most silver metals lose that, but because the Salton metals were stored for so long and nobody handled them or, or were still, you know, took some metal cleaner to them, uh, tarnish remover, uh, as so many uh, metals, or, you know, they suffer from this or uh, put coating on them. I mean, this is, this is a very, very beautiful work. And um, this is um, another metal that has a beautiful um, uh, patina, uh, again, with you know, the high points having been cleaned at one point. But this is by uh, Jean Varin of 1630 of Cardinal Richelieu with you know, a spectacular reverse. Uh, and uh, it's showing, uh, the inscription says that, um, that uh, Fort, uh, Fortu Fortuna, right, conquered. This is how the conquered follow. And the reverse shows Fortuna uh, being uh, blindfolded, right, fortune, which can be good or bad, but you know, fate is out of one's control, but she's being, now she's under control of uh, triumphant France, uh, who, uh, is, whose chariot is being driven by fame, blowing her trumpet, and above victory crowns France. Uh, what I love about uh, this medal, or one of the things, is the, the extraordinary uh, curve of the exurge uh, at the bottom above uh, Byron's signature, uh, where um, it's almost as if, you know, this chariot is, you know, circling the whole earth. Um, and uh, also uh, here is the combination of, of detail, the figurative complexity combined with extraordinary detail. So if you look at the, uh, the chariot itself um, and all of the, uh, the decoration in relief on the chariot, uh, the, the ability to show figures in three quarter view, uh, just to take a look at the horses, right? One horse is actually heading back into the background. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, reverse, uh, so bold and powerful. Now this is 1630 um, and in compositional complexity and daring, I think we, oh, and I should have shown you the detail where you can see it better. Missed that part, but uh, I'll let you take a look. But in compositional complexity and daring, I think that uh, we can safely put the, uh, the Varan uh, reverse along with um, Poussin's Rape of the Sabine Women uh, which was painted uh, shortly before the medal um, and was acquired uh, by Cardinal Richelieu in 1634. Uh, and you see the same treatment, you know, this intertwining of bodies uh, and, and complexity, but the same desire in this moment in the French, uh, you know, in France, uh, in the French Baroque, to maintain this kind of classical clarity above all. Uh, so this is, I think, a, a really wonderful pairing um, uh, that the Salton collection brings to the Met. Now, 
all that glitters. Uh, here you see the salt and metals in there, the little packets uh, with the etiquettes uh, that were made by, written by Mark Salton. These are all together. Uh, and I just shot the, the gold uh, coin, uh, metal, sorry, uh, in um, that storage. Um, and I wanted to show you now toward the end of this talk, uh, some of the uh, some of the works, uh, the metals and gold. This is an extraordinary struck metal uh, by Gaspare Mola of uh, Carlo Emanuel uh, the First of Savoy, and it was struck in uh, 1606. Uh, the reverse shows um, uh, the Chiron, uh, the centaur, uh, who, because he was the teacher, right, the the wise centaur. Uh, when upon his passage, uh, he became the constellation uh, Sagittarius. Uh, the level of, of accuracy and precision uh, in this metal uh, is, is breathtaking. And it, uh, it is uh, similar in spirit uh, to a work made uh, about 20 years before by the engraver uh, Anibale Fontana. This is from in the Mets collection. And it shows Hercules uh, killing Nessus, the centaur. And I don't need to tell um, people in the audience that, um, you know, Mola and, and others, uh, when they worked at the Mint, uh, they, they created, uh, you know, they were engravers. They engraved the dyes and gem engraving, again, uh, is an allied art with um, metal production, metallic production. And uh, these two works are so like in spirit, but also in um, the process of thinking and the skills uh, that are needed to, to execute them uh, by, the, by the artist, uh, because both uh, derive from engraving. Um, And this is just uh, because uh, uh, this is an 18th century medal and I'm almost done. Um, I'm just showing it because uh, I have a soft spot for uh, Wiedemann who was the medalist to uh, Empress Maria Theresia. Uh, and this medal dates to, uh, what is it, 1784. Um, and uh, it shows uh, Maria Theresia um, being crowned as uh, Queen of Hungary, the very first uh, Habsburg to rule Hungary. And uh, the reverse shows her uh, undergoing the coronation ceremony in Pressburg, uh, where she had to learn how to ride a horse. I would, I never, I mean, I never go to the Lippenzahner uh, stables and look in to see the horses without thinking of uh, um, this medal. Um, and uh, she, she had to, uh, learn how to ride a horse. It had to rear on a great pile of earth in the center of the city in, in Pressburg that was made for the coronation. Uh, and she had to have the horse rear in four directions, uh, you know, the four cardinal directions. And at each point while the horse was, you know, in the air, uh, she declared that she would uh, protect Hungary from all enemies uh, from any direction. And uh, I'm showing you this medal too, because we just received an example in 2019 uh, from the bequest of Mrs. Jane Reitzman. So the Salton, the addition of the Salton medal will allow us to show this really engaging uh, uh, portrait and reverse by Wiedemann uh, side, by, you know, side by side. Uh, lastly, I couldn't, I didn't have time to do Dutch medals and I apologize uh, for that. Um, but I'm showing you a, a surprising uh, Danish uh, struck silver medal showing a, a, a battle, a battle scene. And um, again, uh, the breadth of the landscape um, and the excitement uh, of the battle. This is, is, you know, is as good as a Van der Velde painting as far as I can uh, say, you know, that it's uh, just extraordinary. And on the right is one of the latest medals. Uh, it was, uh, it's a silver medal uh, and it's thus far not been, uh, you know, doc documented by, by Mark Salton. It was just kind of at the bottom of the box, but it, um, 
it was issued by Wilhelm I in Berlin and celebrates the 18th of June, 1871. Um, now, what I show you here are two images of, of war and the end of wars, that were the triumphant end of wars in 1871. Uh, but I'd like to end the talk with an extraordinary image of peace. This is the Agricultural Prize Medal um, that was uh, created for uh, George III of Brunswick and uh, in the 1760s. And um, what the inscription says uh, above uh, the cornucopia and the uh, rising sun and the church on a hill where all is at peace, Munera diligentiae, and that is, uh, of diligence, the gift, that wealth, that abundance, that all of this is, is the gift of diligence. That is the message. Um, and this medal, which is beautiful in and of itself, uh, makes me think of the gift uh, of the Sultans to the Met uh, and their extraordinary, the extraordinary diligence and courage that they showed during their lives, uh, both in uh, the tragic times and also in the, the joy and the love of collecting and learning about the medals. So I'd like to close with that gift, uh, sort of as a holiday present uh, for all of you. And uh, not only with the reverse of this medal, but also with uh, Mark Salton's etiquette and his notes that came with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise, for that wonderful talk and uh, this presentation of all this beautiful and wonderful material. Um, I'd like to invite uh, the audience now to unmute and ask uh, questions, make comments, whatever you like, just unmute yourself. I see Ben has a question. Uh, yeah, thanks for a uh, wonderful and interesting um, presentation. Um, my question is, will the Met actually start acquiring medals to add to the Sultan and other medallic art objects in this collection? Or are they going to rely only on gifts and donations to keep growing in this area? Um, I think that, you know, I can't speak for the entire department, uh, but since, uh, and I also have another colleague in sculptor who does 17th or 18th and 19th century. So we would have that discussion together. I think if something wonderful came by that would add to uh, the collection now, I mean, the Met collection has gained a kind of grounding with, uh, you know, this comprehensive collection uh, from the Sultan bequest. So, if something came along uh, that was like the, the Bertoldo of Filippo de' Medici medal, right? That was so good and that was acquired in 1974. I think, yeah, I think we seriously would consider it. Um, but as with everything, uh, medals as with everything else at the Met, um, donations are always most gratefully accepted. Uh, because the active collectors uh, in the field uh, have many medals that uh, would, could be added easily. I'll just say that. We have a little question in the chat. Will these medals be exhibited? If so, how? Okay, so uh, I showed some, like, uh, for instance, the, the wonderful... Uh, uh, struck silver medal by Domenico Poggini of, of Cosimo de' Medici. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna put that next to the, uh, the lapis lazuli portrait, right? Because they, they're directly related. Um, I would like to uh, place uh, the uh, Andrea Gritti uh, bulla uh, in the case uh, that, uh, that has uh, the Venetian works of art in the bronzes gallery. Um, and um, so there are things that are fairly easy to do. Uh, and I am not going to rely on fabrication of, you know, uh, mounts that are like wedge mounts. 
because uh, we, we can't at this point add more to the workload. We're still, still coming out of the, you know, we don't have the numbers of people at the Met to do that. Uh, so I'm just gonna lie them flat. Uh, and all we need is a label. And um, so that kind of thing will happen. Uh, when we have everything sort of cataloged uh, or this is cataloged for acquisition, um, the real work starts after that because uh, they all, the salt and metals need to be photographed professionally. What I showed you were my snapshots and the record shots that were taken by the registrar. Uh, that, that's not photographing metals. Uh, that they look this good on the screen is a testament to how wonderful they are. Uh, but uh, after that, uh, we are now working very closely in my department with European paintings. And uh, we will, they will open their galleries next year, but we're going to try to incorporate metals thereafter because the Salton bequest came too late, but we will do something up there as well. I wonder if I could ask a question, Denise. Sure. Um, you made a point that metals that are not necessarily originals have a role in your comparative display policy. Yeah. So Renaissance medals of which many of the Salton collection were Renaissance medals, fall in both the category of what you might think of as an original or what you might think of as a very close copy. So I'd like to ask you a general question about the policy of the Met in this regard. Do you feel that originality is critical in the display of Renaissance medals? Um. I, I'm, I'm going to sort of in, paraphrase something that Stephen Schur taught me, and that is that, you know, the only original metal is, is the, the model and everything else. But, but then quality, of course, varies thereafter. Um, the, for instance, the Pisanello medal of Leonello d'Este with the wonderful reverse of the lion uh, in Cupid. Uh, that medal, I think I, I would display that. Uh, and uh, because it is a compelling work of art. It's a metal that is, you know, sort of of the period. It's not an 18th century or 17th century cast. And uh, what I think it would need is for that, uh, a, a cleaning that would sort of help with the, uh, the rather uh, intrusive, you know, red, reddish varnish that was applied some at some later time. Uh, but no, I think that that metal uh, should be displayed and it will allow us to, you know, to bring them, uh, bring metals more into the sort of discourse uh, that is always part of a, a discourse of objects. It's always part of an installation. So does that ask, answer your question? Well, let me sharpen the question a little bit. Okay. Would you rather have a beat up original or a perfect electrotype for display purposes? Oh, um, that's that's not okay. What the question I answered was uh, not that question. It's not. This is a different question to my mind. Uh, a copy is never uh, a copy is never going to have the uh, the uh, feeling, right? The personality. Uh, the sense of process, the sense of invention, right? From model to making. Uh, a copy is never gonna have that. There's something dead about a copy. So the Lehman collection has these 19th century copies of Renaissance medals, right? Um, and they just, it, it's sort of like, I think that they put those together just as examples, like, you know, like plaster casts. Uh, they're useful, uh, you know, if there's some kind of, you know, some kind of tragedy that uh, results in the destruction of a work of art, then copies are useful for that reason. Uh, but uh, as objects that should be placed on display, no, I wouldn't put those out. Is but, that, how's that? It's, it's a hedge, but I think it's fair. I, yeah, I, no. I don't have an answer to the question. It's just yeah. that there is obviously a tension that you've expressed, and it's only because you yourself 
made the point that although something was a cast, you found it worthy because of its intrinsic art value. Yeah. Play. And that's why I asked this. Yeah, yeah. Question. Yeah, so the, yeah, was it the later casts, um, they, they are representative. And this is, you know, as I said, I learned this from Stephen and I believe this, uh, they're representative, they give back. Uh, but a, a copy, like a 19th century copy that's made for documenting purposes, no. That's the distinction. Thanks. Sure. Are there any other questions for Denise? All right, well, we thank you again uh, for this wonderful talk and thank you everyone for coming. Thank uh, you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication and events, you can support the society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.